Hi, I'm John Renan, and I'm the Director of Coaches for the Recreational Pre Academy programs for the Cherokee Impact. I'd like to welcome uh, I welcome you to our session on uh, Soccer 101 for those of you who are new to the sport or have questions about how we do things here at the Cherokee Impact. Uh, we'd like to uh, welcome you here because uh, we have lots of times people come in, they don't really know a lot about soccer and they don't know exactly what's expected of them or expected of their child. So we wanted to answer a lot of your questions off the bat so if you had any uh, uh, concerns about anything, hopefully this uh, short video will address them. So today what we're going to be covering is what to expect in practices. So uh, you know, what, you, what we would want you to do at practice, what your kids are going to be doing at practice, what you should be looking for from your coaches. And it's really critical that uh, you be uh, cognizant of what your coaches are doing uh, because they are going to be the ones who are going to be the one helping your child develop. And if you know what you're supposed to be looking for, you can kind of tell whether or not your coach is doing a good job or not. And then second is uh, how we perform it or how we behave at games and what you can see at games. And then finally, you know, some ways to help your children at home um, to develop as soccer players, especially if they, get, again, have never really played soccer before. And we'll also talk about sportsmanship and uh, the Cherokee Impacts to Steer or Don't Cheer program. So our philosophy is uh, got three parts to it. The number one thing is that everything is child-centered. We want this to be a great growth experience, but we want to focus on the child first. All right. So the first thing is that we're going to have exercises that are developmentally appropriate, and we're going to have philosophy. Um, we're going to be teaching our kids has to do with how they think and how their brains are functioning. So for the first one that we do, an example of that is no passing is taught to under six-year-old players because under six-year-old players don't know what's going to happen after a ball is passed away from them. And they don't like to have, let's say they have the ball as their toy. And there's a toy on the field. They want that toy. They want to keep their toy. They don't want to share their toy with anybody. So even though a child may pass a ball to a parent or trusted adult, and a child may pass the ball to them, and parents think, oh, my child's ready for passing, they're really not ready for passing. They're only giving it to you because they have the expectation that you would give the ball back to them. So samples of that are going to be abounding through our program. Uh, we don't punt in under uh, 8 and under 10 for our goalkeepers because uh, nobody can control the bouncing ball very well. And uh, it turns out when the goalkeeper distributes the ball, they don't, uh, by tossing it or rolling it or passing it, uh, we get a far better level of play. So we're always going to be focused on activities and actions that are developmentally appropriate. The second thing is that uh, this is not a uh, authoritarian uh, program where the coach tells the player exactly what to do and the player then goes out and executes it. It's not a closed skill sport like bowling or baseball might be. Uh, this is an open skill sport where you have uh, uh, lots of decisions that have to be made. And so what we get to our philosophy here is that we want to give the child a problem to solve, not a solution to implement. And basically what that means is that whenever we have an exercise, uh, the child should through activity, figure out what needs to be done. Uh, some of it is thinking, some of it is doing, uh, but there's going to be some discovery method. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that development is going to be a little bit more slow in the beginning. Uh, the end result later on, the longer they play soccer, is that they take control of it, they make it their own uh, game, and then that allows us to uh, have players who are capable of problem solving. Uh, even when there's no coach, no parent, uh, you know, they're in a very high pressure situation, they can come up with a solution to the problem at hand. So again, child-centered, focused on discovery. And finally, is that uh, in most of our divisions, we don't uh, keep score, or the score is not the present. We don't keep track of results very well uh, in our games because we're focused more on the player development, individual player development. So winning is important. Kids are going to want to know, did we win the game? Did we win the game? Did we win the game? Uh, but for them, it's a very transient thing. You know, They may have forgot that they, you know, what happened, the result of the game, half an hour later. Adults, they're going to think about the game all week. Um, but for us, as a, uh, as a club, what we're really looking to do is emphasize the development of the individual player. And that is going to come in front of, you know, did my team win this week? How many goals did we win by? How many goals did we score? So when you go out there and you see your player, that's going to be evidenced by a few things. Number one is that everybody gets a, uh, an opportunity to play a significant amount of time, a minimum of 50%. We'll talk about that a little bit later. They're going to play a variety of different positions, and they are going to uh, uh, be exposed to uh, uh, different situations as often as possible so that their skills develop and the, and the development is focused or the instruction is focused on development of the player's skills as opposed to their tactical awareness. 
Now, a little bit about your coaches. Um, if you're not the coach, uh, then you probably uh, have figured out that your coaches are volunteers. Um, they are educated. We provide a uh, training program for the coaches. Uh, every season, we have a minimum four-hour refresher course that coaches take. Some coaches take a licensing course. It's offered through the state and uh, offered um, through the, uh, the state association. And state association, it's going to give them a license, like a G license or an F license or an E license. Uh, and some of your coaches may even be D licensed. But every coach gets training every season so that they uh, can improve their uh, um, their skills and be up on the most appropriate methods. They're supported by me. Uh, I'm the director of the program and uh, I have the training sessions run. I evaluate the coaches. I'm there for the coaches. If they have trouble with something, then I'm the person that they would contact. Uh, and this is provide them with some method of support so that they have a uh, feeling that there's uh, somebody behind them uh, that's got some experience, got some interest in their success. And we really want to under you to understand uh, that we support them and we would like you to support them as well. And finally, they are evaluated, so each season we are going to uh, um, do an evaluation. So if coaches are having difficulties, we'll try to address those through instruction. Uh, and if they are uh, uh, doing well, then we're going to uh, try to push them to do, uh, to do more stuff, take more licensing courses, uh, maybe coach other teams. Uh, it really is a, a system that's designed to help the coach who is literally the face of the club. You may see me today, you may see me on the videos, you may see me walking around, but the one you're going to have contact with is the coach. And it's really important that the coach be able to uh, uh, communicate um, how soccer should be played at the charity impact. And so you are a part of that process, you help to support them, and we also you also help to evaluate them uh, at the end of the season. All right, so what to expect to practice? Well, if you are a U6 parent, um, your practice is probably going to last 45 minutes to an hour, and uh, you're going to have um, it, could be longer. It could be longer than 45 minutes. But most of the time, 45 minutes is about as long as a four or five year old can last. Uh, our eights and tens, a solid 60 minute practice is really good. Uh, the U12s and up, that's going to be uh, closer to 75 minutes or an hour. Uh, it's 90 minutes. And then the U6 and 8 typically practice once per week. Some of the U8 coaches do practice twice per week. The U10 and up all practice twice per week. There is one game. Uh, per week for teams. Now it could be because of rainouts, uh, because of makeups, because of schedule changes that uh, you may play a midweek game or you may play a game on Saturday and Sunday, but that's usually, uh, that's pretty unusual. That might happen once per season. So when you look at a practice, one of the things we really want you to look for is whether or not your child is engaged. And by engaged, we mean, are they participating actively? We don't love, we don't promote lines, laps, and lectures. And so constantly engaged means your kids are participating actively in the uh, activity. It's soccer or soccer related activity and they're not standing around waiting for it. And there's no laps in soccer. So if we're, uh, if we're running laps, then that means that we're, uh, we're running for fitness, uh, but we are not running for soccer. Soccer fitness is way different than running laps. All right, so the second thing is you're gonna see your player touching the ball, uh, both not in pressure and under pressure throughout the practice. So what you're going to see is that they have a lot of uh, touches on the ball and then sometimes those touches, or at the beginning of practice, the touches should not be under pressure and as you go through the practice, the pressure builds, pressure builds, pressure builds until they get to the game part of practice. So a significant segment of practice, if you've got a U8, your, uh, U8 20 to 30 minutes of a practice should be the game or uh, a scrimmage. And that is something that we look for from all our coaches. They know what to expect. They know what's supposed to be there. And if they're not getting those done, those are kinds of things that you may say, hey, well, you know, maybe tonight is a little bit hot. We wanted to kind of shorten it up or whatever. Uh, but in general, in practices, uh, they should be playing for a significant part of the practice. Next is that we know that when we have novices at any activity, that there's two types of criticism. There's a, a positive criticism, there's negative criticism. But with novices, positive works much better than negative at motivating players. And you know that the younger the players are, the more effort matters to them. And so, uh, uh, you know, coaches can uh, correct for uh, defects in skill, but they should always be rewarding effort. So when kids are trying, they should be, uh, um, coaches should be having positive comments about those. Right. Now, what the player is supposed to bring to practice is uh, pretty important, um, and we want to make sure you're consistent at this. They want to look like they're going to play soccer, so they should be bringing in both balls, shin guards, 
those are required, shin guards are required, and then they should bring in appropriate shoes and water. Now, if you forget one day to bring uh, the right shoes and your kid has tennis shoes or whatever, they're, they're going to be fine. And we've had a few, we've had kids practice in jeans sometimes, although it's kind of hot. Um, but if you forgot the stuff and then you have, uh, uh, you only have jeans or whatever, the kid, kid can play. We don't want to deny a kid an opportunity to play because they're wearing jeans. Uh, but we do want to make sure you understand that shin guards are required in every practice and game. Uh, appropriate shoes are uh, important as well. Uh, the ball helps the coach move the practice along better. The more ball access there is, the better off the, uh, uh, the session is going to go. Finally, and I cannot emphasize this to you enough, please show up on time for your practice. Uh, it's very hard for your coaches to uh, um, get to practice and find out only three people are there and uh, you know people are kind of dribbling in. It's really hard to get a momentum for your practice and hard to get quality touches in. So as much as possible, show up on time. If you're going to be late, please let the coach know. All right, in games, what you're really looking at first and foremost is are my kids playing? And uh, now most of our teams are staffed so that there are less than uh, um, there's less subs on the field than there are less players off the field as subs than there are on the field. Uh, so that each player should be playing at least 50% of every game. And uh, that is something that you do want to pay attention to. Sometimes kids, when they first start, they're a little bit um, timid about going out there, or if they go out there and it doesn't go too well for them, they may want to come off the field. Uh, but sometimes their coaches get kind of involved in the game, and they're like, oh, we want to win this game, and so you know, uh, your son or daughter might not play as much. And we don't, we don't want that. And what you want is to understand is at least 50% of every game. Uh, so if it's a 50-minute game, then they should be playing at least 25 minutes. And our coaches are very good at that, but sometimes you know life gets in the way, things get uh, heated, or for whatever reason that might not happen. Um, just you can let me know or talk to the coach about why that might not happen. Now sometimes kids don't want to play the game, uh, and they give uh, um, I. Evidence to that, I guess, is the best way to say it, by uh, uh, maybe misbehaving in some way, uh, and then the coach uh, may do it as a punishment to keep them out of games. But um, you're, uh, you paid your money, and your kid uh, is uh, allowed to play at least 50% of every game. So even if you miss practice or anything like that, your kid is, is, is supposed to play at least 50%. You need to let me know if that doesn't happen, uh, especially if it happens, doesn't, doesn't happen more than once. But also talk to your child if they're not having a good time, if they're not getting along well, uh, if they're struggling and they just are not are losing interest in it, we'd like to kind of catch that before it happens. And that may be one of the reasons why uh, they're, they're, they're playing us. So if that's the case, uh, just uh, you know, maybe contact me or talk to the coach first and say, you know, does my son seem like or daughter seem like he or she is engaged in the game or uh, you know, having a good time out there? And we can kind of see, you know your child. All right, second is that players have to play more than one position, and uh, they should play more than one position during a game. There's forwards, midfielders, and defenders, and then there's inside and there's outside positions, and they should be able to play a variety of positions. Now, if we're talking about the U6, there are no positions in U6. We don't level them out. We just put three players on the field, and they play. And uh, those kids can go pretty much anywhere they want. They're really not position aware. We don't coach them for positioning. And in U8, it's a little bit of positioning. And it's not until we get to 12s and 14s that really positions are going to be kind of crucial for us. All right. And then when we say coaches let the players play, we're talking about coaches who are not standing on the sideline, uh, screaming at their players, telling them exactly what to do the entire time. They can be cheering. They can be excited. Uh, they can offer instruction. Uh, but those kinds of things are things that are going to be limited. And when you go to the cheer, don't steer section here, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the coach wants to let the player play. The coach is supposed to be watching the player. All right. Um, I do want to warn you about a couple of things. You are going to need to bring um, halftime snacks or post-game snacks at least once during the season. Um, when you get to the game, uh, just remember that you guys are going to be sitting on the side of the field. There's one side for parents, and there's another side for players and coaches. All right, and they would also ask that you don't sit or stand by the goal. Sometimes parents want to coach their kid when the, coach, the kid is playing goalkeeper, and uh, uh, they stand next to the goal. That's not allowed. Uh, let your kid uh, play. Let your kid figure it out. All right, uh, during games, just like a practice, uh, you want to show up on time. In fact, you want to show up early. Most coaches are going to ask you to be there 30 minutes early. We do have a problem with parents who, uh, I mean, obviously, if you have um, three kids playing at three different locations at three different times, it's going to be hard to get there early. Uh, but in general, um, we would like to have you there at least 30 minutes uh, before the game. And coaches will understand if you call them and say, hey, I'm not going to get there till five minutes before the game. What they're not going to understand is if you don't call them and show up at game time, hey, we're ready to play, uh, they've set a schedule, they've set a system, 
uh, and that makes it more difficult for them. We want to make it as easy as possible for coaches as possible for coaches. All right, and then home or away is on the schedule, and your location is always uh, uh, the same. So one side is going to be home, the other side is going to be away, and that's going to tell you what color uniform to make. Just to be safe, you want to bring both sets of uniforms. All right, so in case you misread it or the coach sent the wrong information or some change occurred, bring both uniforms. And when you do wear your uniforms, it's all one color, all one color. It's not mixed colors like blue and red or red and blue. It's going to be all blue or it's going to be all red. Okay? Thank you. All right, so what can you do at home? Well, the first thing you do is uh, get the kids out to play. And uh, we see that so often is that the kids who are very motivated by something, are gonna be, they're going to want to do it uh, even when they're not supposed to be doing it. You know, so uh, instead of doing, uh, you know, playing a video game or watching TV or reading a book, something like that, if you want them to do some physical activity, let's go play some soccer outside. Maybe get some friends together. Uh, kids playing outside free, during their free time is probably the best teacher we have for uh, for skill in soccer, skill acquisition in soccer. All right, and the second thing is to play with your child. So uh, it's fun to play soccer. If you and your child are both novices in soccer, it's a great thing to go out there and try it on your own. You can see what it's like. Soccer is a very unique sport. There are situations that come up all the time. Uh, you may think that uh, one thing is uh, supposed to happen and then something else happens. And then the exact same situation comes up and it's solved in a different way. Uh, so many things that can happen out there. If you play with your child, you guys can grow in the sport together. Finally, I would suggest that you uh, watch some professional soccer. There's some amazing stuff that you see out there. Uh, access to games is, is, is huge. Uh, we have World Cup qualifying this fall. We have World Cup next summer. Um, we have uh, professional leagues showing on, uh, on sports networks um, all over the place, ESPN, NBC Sports, Fox Sports 1. They're all going to be covering soccer. Uh, your Spanish language uh, telecasts are also going to be offering soccer. You could pretty much find soccer, even if you don't have Gold TV or Fox Soccer or BN Sports, uh, any of those, uh, you can find soccer games every weekend, uh, more than enough to, to watch. And then attending Silverbacks games or attending professional games that might occur uh, or international games that might occur is also a great way to see stuff that you wouldn't normally see. All right, so we have our uh, three core skills that each of our coaches is supposed to focus on. And these core skills are going to be ones that we are going to have the coaches provide exercises for every season. And these are ones that are going to help them improve their skills uh, from beginning to end. So the first one we're going to see uh, is called shield and turn. And what happens there is the players need to be able to put their body between the other player and the ball. And then as they do that, that's going to allow them to buy time. It's going to slow the game down and allow a player to keep possession of the ball even when they're under a great deal of pressure. Most of the time, novice players, when the ball is they're pressured, um, they just kick the ball away. And we don't want them to kick the ball away. Uh, that problem solving that they do by kicking the ball away is not really going to help them uh, over the long term. We don't want them to kick the ball away under any circumstances at all. One way to avoid doing that is called the shield and turn. Uh, second way is uh, dribbling. And uh, we really want to emphasize dribbling, uh, especially in the younger age groups. We talked about the U6 is not passing. Well, one of the things that U6s love to do is they like to keep the ball, they like to dribble, and they like to shoot. They don't want to share it. So we're going to say, hey, uh, if you don't want to lose the ball, maybe you have to dribble around somebody. So lots of activities involving dribbling. And especially if you have uh, players who are very uh, um, inexperienced uh, or not very confident, dribbling is a tough thing to do. So we want to encourage that. Our coaches want to push dribbling as a primary skill um, to solve problems. Now the third one is controlling the ball. And that's a, a difficult thing for kids when their ball is bouncing up in the air like this. A lot of times they have a tendency to try and kick the ball away. And what we'd like them to do instead is to control the ball. All right, so instead of playing up uh, really high, what we'd like to have them do is let the ball drop to the ground or drop near the ground, use their foot or their thigh to control the ball. So bouncing balls are especially troublesome for U8s and above. Uh, balls in the air are very troublesome for U10. So a lot of times if you throw a ball at a kid's head at U10 or just throw the ball in their area, they're going to duck away because they're afraid of getting hit by the ball. What we want them to do is to recognize and control the situation. So controlling the ball, uh, the more faster you control the ball, buys you more time to do something with the ball. So the faster you control it, the more likely you are to dribble. And then if you shield and turn, the less likely you kick the ball away. You're going to keep the ball. Uh, these three core skills are the foundation that we have for every coach at every level. And those are things that you should see in your uh, 
your training sessions every day. What are we working on today, coach? We're working on dribbling, shield and turn, our control. As the players get older, we add stuff to it. Like with the under sixes, it's dribbling and um, shooting. Uh, with the under eights, there might be a little bit of passing. With the under tens, there's a little bit more passing. Um, so, but these are the three core skills that should be the focus of every coach. Now, one of the things that we have an issue with over uh, time is uh, parent and coach behavior. And this is primarily during game situations, and it's not everybody. In fact, most of the parents and coaches I know are very well behaved, very positive, very reinforcing. All right. So this is our sportsmanship pledge, uh, and this is uh, called Cheer, Don't Steer. And so you're going to get a card like this when you go out with your coach. Um, and on one side it says cheer, and these are things that you can say to your, your child or to your team or even to the other team. Um, these are positive things that are non-specific uh, and are not trying to help players solve problems and not saying anything negative to the players. Uh, the steer things are things we often hear uh, the time where uh, one parent says, uh, or a coach says, kick it away, get it out of there, get rid of it. Um, and so these are basically what you're doing is you're telling your player, uh, the child, what you want them to do. The problem is that, uh, like we talked about earlier, kicking the ball away is not a skill that's going to benefit anybody. And what it does is it just solves today's problem, uh, but creates problems in the future. As you get older, players get more skilled. There are very few of them are going to kick it away. Uh, so if you were still kicking it away or telling them to kick it away, uh, then it doesn't really help them develop. And then uh, it also takes away the decision-making power from them. And remember, what them they have the freedom to solve problems. And they can't do that if somebody is telling them what to do. And the other issue we have is uh, when a parent says one thing on one side of the field and the coach says something else on the other side of the field, your child wants to make you proud. If you tell him or her to do something, by and large, he will try to do that thing. Your child wants to make the coach proud. Same idea. But what happens if the coach and the parent are telling the player something else? So imagine a ball is bouncing towards you. Two players are running at you. Your coach is saying dribble it, and your parent is saying kick it away or uh, you know, uh, um, you know, pass the ball, something like that. Well, this, as this ball comes to this child who's trying to figure out what to do with her body, with the ball, with the situation, and plus they're trying to satisfy two different adults that they respect and love, uh, well, what's going to happen is they're just going to get rid of it. The easiest thing for them to do is kick it away because if they kick it away, they don't have to deal with it anymore. All right, so cheer, don't steer is our philosophy, and this relates to our sportsmanship as well. So we have uh, three kinds of sportsmanship that we're going to refer to. One is the uh, uh, opponent. Uh, we want you to treat the opponent with respect. We don't want you to yell things at children who are on the other field, but these are children, and they deserve our love, they deserve our respect, they do not deserve to be abused by players or uh, parents, uh, adults, yelling at them about uh, uh, things that are happening on soccer field. Second is the referees, and this is something we tell our, um, our coaches as well. We want to make sure you're clear on this. Is referees are not introduced until U10. Uh, the youngest age groups get the least experienced referees. Referees are out there to ensure the safety of all participants. That is their primary job. If they get a throw-in wrong or if they get a uh, foul wrong, that is not a bad thing. That is part of their development process. And I want you to understand that you can go a long way towards helping improve the quality of referees by not complaining about the quality of referees. What happens is that uh, the referees get abused by parents and by coaches, and they say, you know, even though I'm getting paid for this, I don't really want to deal with this. It makes me very uncomfortable. So please treat your referees with respect. They are the third element of the field after players and coaches, and they are very important. Without them, we would not have uh, games to be able to play. Finally, uh, sportsmanship regarding your teammates. So sometimes your kids get along with their teammates, and sometimes they don't. But Sometimes you don't you don't really get a chance to pick your teammates, and so that's what we have here. A lot of times is we have kids who are coming in, they don't get a chance to pick their teammates, uh, and they don't know their teammates, so they may not be treating them with respect and sportsmanship. Uh, so teammates are going to be players who are going to be with you for a long period of time, over and over again, repeatedly. So if there's any issues that come up, uh, we want to make sure that uh, you don't treat other teammates poorly, and your child doesn't treat teammates. Um, just because somebody comes into a field and they make a mistake does not mean you need to yell at that player about making that mistake. All right. So 
If you have any questions, you can certainly email me. Uh, there's my email address, jmernat at csaimpact.com, or you can email Louise uh, uh, Schweiger in the office and at csa at csaimpact.com. If you have any further questions, I'd love to talk to you about it, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the field. Thank you very much.